And I remember reading somewhere, maybe somebody saying to me once that decline remains our fate. She asked me to come into the bedroom because there's something she wants to show me. And I get there and she's wearing this dress and the idea that I was married to her and we had our girl and this was our life. Who wants to think about the future when the present is this monumental? Her. Her. She gives her to me. She looks like a heart. We're smiling. <laughs> he used to try and convince me the understanding of the rational number that's commonly known as pi, that is to five decimal. Pi. Can I ask you something? Uh-huh. Do you ever think about getting married? I ask him, where is he? You mean generally or you mean specifically? <laughs> he says who? I say God. I said, Dad, Dad, some guy on TV, he's stolen your song. Just because we don't know it doesn't mean we won't know. One day, we will. Hey. Welcome to people. Hey, everybody. OK, so just to start off, can you guys give us a little bit of a rundown of what the show is? Because it's actually two different pieces put together to make one complete work of art. Yeah. Oh, a, um, well, it's interesting because that pe the piece, um, it's evolved from when we made that first sort of uh, promo in the video of the show. It's really a show about two men um, getting up and speaking about their lives, um, both being fathers. My character is about to become a dad and then he is a dad. And um, story is really about both of our stories about like faith and family and love and uh, how much we love our wives and um, how much we kind of love our children. And it's uh, it's pretty, it's hard to explain and put into words. You kind of have to experience it because it's a different experience with every audience every night. Um, it really is us all communally coming together and kind of sharing our own lives and our stories with the audience and then you with us. That's great. Um, so where, where did the idea to take two separate monologues and put them into one show come from? Well, uh, we'd been talking for a while, haven't we, about trying to find something to do together. And I had a pre-existing relationship with both of the writers, Nick Payne and Simon Stevens are both British playwrights and they're both writers I'd worked with a lot at home. And Tom had a long held love affair with Seawall. And Jake had been kind of obsessed with doing Nick's piece. And I think Jake had been bugging Nick for about seven years, hadn't you, trying to persuade him to let him do the piece. Nick first wrote the play um, for himself to perform. And it was, it's incredibly personal. It's a really, really um, interior piece about his own life. And so it's kind of evolved and grown on this lovely journey. Um, and then we decided to put the two pieces together and they have a sort of strange amount of connected themes and ideas. And so over time, the writing has evolved and, and it's sort of become like a holistic evening of theatre. Mm -hmm. So you both had the individual pieces in mind. Um, as opposed to like, oh, we're going to pick these two plays and let's find two actors to do it. So can, Tom, can you tell us about how you found Seawall and, and where you kind of fell in love with it? Um, so th this is the third play that I've done with the writer, Simon Stevens. Um, and he came to see a play, that I, a production of 1984 that I did here in New York. Um, and afterwards he just gave it to me and said, will you read this? Um, and... Uh, I, I mean, I, I found it just an extraordinary, perfect piece of writing, um, and that in itself was a kind of, you know, w w was the beginning of my love for it. But also, very specifically, it was about someone my age uh, who was the father of a young daughter, and. Uh, I happened to be my age and the father of a young daughter. Um, and like, I was like, fuck, wait a second. <laughs> um, I, I, and I hadn't really experienced a, a, a kind of drama that explored that, the kind of, that, that kind of love. Um, and I was kind of excited to talk about it in front of people. That's great. And if you, you said you were asking the writer to let you do this show. So how did that come about? How'd you get him to say yes? 
Well, uh, the, the real special thing about this show for all of us behind the scenes is that he's obviously done three shows with Simon. I've This is my third show with Nick. I've done two others. Um, and then Simon and Nick and Carrie have been friends for a really long time. So we have this kind of strange familial thing be- between all of us. Um, and Nick, I had done a show called Constellations a few years ago on Broadway, and it's um, just this beautiful show about this couple and their 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 love. And he gave me the piece that he wrote. It was actually just about his dad. And I fell in love with the piece. Every time I would read it, I would just be laughing and then I would cry. At the end, I would just find myself so moved by it, which over and over again never happens to me. I mean, occasionally there's a book or something, a movie that I see, like the end of Jerry Maguire. I'm always like, <laughs> I- <laughs> has a Jerry Maguire feel. Um, uh, and so I just would ask him yearly and he was so personal to him that he he said no for five years. I would, li- I would ask him every six months, like maybe we could just do it in this little space and it's fine or whatever. He'd be like, nope. Thank, thank you for asking, but no. Um, and then finally, when the two shows kind of came together as an idea, he felt like maybe it was an evening. And he also had just had his daughter and um, talking about his dad and their relationship. And then his dad passed away. And then the birth of his daughter became a show that he felt like he could tell. And um, and that's what he's done. And then Carrie, were you kind of the one who put this all together? Or was this idea already there and you kind of helped form it? How did you you come into this production specifically? Um, it, actually, Jake had contacted me because he'd seen a show of mine in London and we'd been looking for something to do. And then this it was just a sort of confluence of events. Sometimes it happens. Mm-hmm. The public were interested. They were both available. I was available. I flew out. We did a reading of both plays um, in a tiny dressing room, sat around a table with mirrors and about seven people and everyone wept. And at the end of it, we thought, well, we have a show. There's something here. And there was a journey to go on with some of the writing to kind of evolve the two pieces. But it was very clear that day that there was, you know, something really special in the room. And so then it became really kind of simple, actually, which was just to find the dates and move towards production. That's fantastic. And you mentioned the public. So this show originally was off-Broadway at the Public Theater. I actually got to go to opening night. It was amazing. Oh. I know. Um, but we were there too. I know, right? Oh, yeah. You were really good. Oh, thank you. You were such a good audience. I know. So. Just um, you. Yeah, nobody else. Um, but was it always the intention to bring the show to Broadway? You just started previews. You'll be opening soon. And it's a, a new room and a new type of audience coming in. Did you know that you wanted to bring this up to Broadway? Or was it just, let's see where it goes? I think we always felt that it had a sort of really private, quiet, simple feel at the public. And then we realised it was really connecting with audiences and people just had a massive energy for the work. And so then it felt like a kind of inevitable thing to try and grow it and bring it to a bigger audience. And what's been brilliant about moving into the Hudson is even though it's got a much um, bigger space and there are lots more seats, it feels really intimate because the theatre is so well designed. Everybody's kind of tucked around, focused on the stage. And for me as a director, it's been fascinating to watch the kind of energy change. And there's something that happens in this room each night, which is kind of alive, actually. It's like an animal thing. And um, you can hear a pin drop. Everybody's listening. And um, and it feels like the audience are holding Jake and Tom in their hands. And it's it's really special. Yeah, the, the original theatre I read was 299. And now I think it's 975. Mm-hmm. So that's a big jump. But it does feel very intimate. And you guys have really transform the theater. I know you did some some different art projects and there's the lobby has a lot of Polaroids and there's just seeing the back of the theater now. You did a collaboration with an artist. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you made this theater your home? Yeah, well, um, yeah, JR, the uh, installation artist who's done just the most incredible work around the world and he's just an amazing artist. I've known him for a while and somehow there's something about this show that we, as Carrie said, is all about Uh, the audience. I mean, the show is really, I cannot explain how different it is every night. It just depends on the group of people that all come together to see it. And so we came up with this idea. I thought I sort of was thinking, how do we do Broadway in a different way than it's ever really been done? You know, where we lo- I've loved Broadway my entire life. I still do. It's like one of my deepest loves. And But how can you do it in a different way? There's a lot of similar things. And I just thought, 
Broadway shows always sort of look the same and hey, there's the backside of the Hudson Theater um, that we're in and people pass by it all the time. And that's where Tom and I enter every single night. There's this, this huge brick wall. And so I just called up JR and I was like, hey, do you want to do one of your pieces on the backside of the wall? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, through a lot of very hard work from a lot of other people that were not us, um, they figured it out. We took pictures of the first preview, our first show that we did at the Hudson, the audience. And then they printed them on huge pieces of, of paper. And we then glued them all up the side of the backside of the audience. And it's this beautiful art piece that goes up the whole backside of the audience of everybody's faces with all these expressions in our entire audience. Um, and, and JR was just at his whole team at the Inside Out Project that they, the work that they do just, they did this incredible piece up on the backside of our, of our show. And it's almost like the audience that we're looking at is literally right behind us on the backside of the wall of the theater. It's just a really magical thing. That's fantastic. I believe there's a video on the Seawall Alive Instagram kind of showing that process. So you guys should check it out. I was just watching it. I'm like, it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so moving on a little bit, I want to talk more about theater specifically. But this show, I've, I've seen a lot of shows. Um, I've seen everything this season so far. And this is one of those rare runs where you don't have an ensemble. You don't have a cast to kind of support you. It's you on a stage by yourself. You guys aren't even in it together. It's separate acts and it's separate stories that, that somehow flow together. And that seems terrifying to me to just be by yourself with almost a minimalist set and, and kind of a spotlight. So how do, you, how do you go about directing that? How do you guide them? And then how do you guys kind of conquer that potential fear or that challenge of, it's just me, there's nothing else. Um, in terms of directing, I think, I mean, for me, the great pleasure of being a director is to work with actors and, um, and all the work is about, you know, finding truth and detail and specificity and thinking about human behaviour. And so when you get to work with actors of this calibre, it's, you know, at times feels like an almost religious experience. Um, it's, you know, we just can work with such intensity because there in a way is a lot of space for us to sit and talk and, and work. And so both sets of rehearsals, both the original time and then and coming back to it. Um, there's just been this kind of very collaborative, um, somehow really open dialogue and conversation about the work. And I think we've all really, really enjoyed that and found it really satisfying. I can't speak to how terrifying it is to go out on your own because I think it is completely wild. I mean, it is pretty scary, but at the same time, you can't really fuck it up. <laughs> I, I don't be, I'm not being facetious. Like normally when you do a play, you kind of have to go... Okay, I'm in Russia. It's 1922. Like my dad is being played by a man I met two months ago, um, and I'm in love with a horse. And like, no matter how you, you know, what is that play? <laughs> this is the play I'm, That's the play I'm we're rushing next. out to see that one. I'm Broadway next season. But, but no, is... I mean I do know that play. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but, but but so you have to kind of you have to force yourself into this, this tiny space that didn't exist before. Like, so however you feel that day, you have to lie to yourself and go, I don't feel like that. And there are a thousand people in the room and you have to do the biggest lie of all, which is to pretend that you don't exist. Whereas with this, what's amazing is that we don't do any of that. We walk on stage and we go, hey, like, what's up? Like, let's do this. Like, and we look in all of your eyes and go, let's be in this together. And however I feel, if I'm exhausted, if I have the best sleep of my life, if I'm in love, if like I, I don't know, have burnt my foot with a fireball. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, but like, we no, do that. Uh, it's our uh, pre-show <laughs> ritual. Is we, we, we make no, fireballs and we burn feet with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Like it's, it's not. Uh, <laughs> but it's but but I mean, you, we bring that. You walk. You limp on stage or you, or, or whatever. Like and uh, really taking this metaphor too far. Um, but but it, but it does make it less frightening because you, because it's. It, it, you, it's the present moment, and the present moment informs everything. And you can't really be afraid of the present moment because you can't control it. Mm, yeah. I mean, when we first started doing the show, it was terrifying. I mean, the the thought of doing a, a, a monologue. I mean, the monologue is such a like an actor indulgence. You know, when you hear about it, you're like, oh yeah, it's like <laughs> we're acting and saving the world kind of thing. But I um, Team America reference for anybody who's. <laughs> but I like. I think that really. I think you're. I think what I what we we realized was that, like Tom said, 
there's something really deeply comforting when you sort of break the idea um, of, of faking it um, and creating something fictional. And there are fictional things in the story. I mean, there are tons of fictional things. But, but really sharing something with a group of people. But being alone up on stage, I actually find when, you're, when your audience is your scene partner, just the best thing ever. I don't know how I'm gonna be able to go back. I'm gonna be like asking for a group of people behind the actor I'm working with so I can. But uh, it was terrifying at first. It really felt like, I remember, this is a strange thing, but I remember being so scared three or four months before we, we even went on, Tom and I would text each other back and forth and be like, why are we doing this? He's like, I don't know, should we stop it? I don't know if we can. Let me figure out if I can stop it first. You know, it was like that. And then I saw Free Solo and I was like, if that dude can climb that thing alone, <laughs> <laughs> I can get on stage and do a monologue for an hour. Um, and then it was just like, it was a jump in from there. Yeah. There was also, also I, I remember you would like ask, Jake, like asked a, a number of people who'd done monologues really successfully in oh, yeah. to be recently, kind of to, like, expecting like, them to go, hey, fine, yeah, no, go for it. And I remember like, didn't really quite up, go like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Four people were like, why are you doing that? That's terrible. It's a terrible yeah. thing. <laughs> it's like the absolute worst thing to do. Um, but really, the way we do this is so different. And a lot of it has to do with the way Carrie has staged the show and what she's created. It just feels like, it feels like something else. I mean, we can try and talk about it as much as we can, but like, just to come and see and have that experience with us. I mean, that's what it feels like. You're just having this experience with me and Tom. And and anyone who's seen it, I think, can kind of understand that yeah. feeling, but it's very, very hard to put into words. It, I 100% agree. I, like I said, I've seen a lot, and this is, I've never seen anything like this before. This is, there's no, the rest of the world doesn't exist when when you are on the stage. And and when both of the monologues, they're, they're different, but they still have the same theme and the same relation. and. And you forget that, Tom, you finish your first um, your first monologue and the first act ends and you're like, oh, I'm in a theater. Like, we're not just talking one-on-one -on -one right now. Like, you're listening to someone tell you a story and it is just so jaw-droppingly beautiful. And it's something that, go see it, just go see it. <laughs> um, but um, so my question then is, we keep talking about the audience and how important it is. Then how do you rehearse? Because you don't have an audience. <clears throat> what was that process like? Oh my God, poor, poor Carrie and the whole and our and our assistant director Rory, who sat there for weeks. I'm going to do the face and, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just We're like, just like really intensely listening the whole time, and then you your kind of eye would droop, and they'd be like, "I'm I'm not doing it anymore. You're not listening." <laughs> true. There'd be a moment where they, they'd stop going, like, mm. "Oh, so interested," and we'd be like, "Oh, that didn't work." But yeah. they had to sit through hours and hours listening to the same thing. I mean, eight hours a day yeah. <laughs> for Carrie. five weeks. <laughs> but we used to get groups in and we had um, seats in the rehearsal studio. We had a kind of bank of seats. And so we would just get people off the street, basically. Wouldn't we? We'd sort of round them in and make them sit attentively. And mm -hmm. So we tried to practice the whole time what that would feel like. But of course, then when we moved into the theatre both times, we've had to completely rediscover the show because it kind of just keeps shunting and shifting in ways that you can't anticipate. And the first night at the Hudson was completely wild. I don't think any of us have ever experienced anything like it. The laughs were coming and there was this kind of engagement that was, yeah, really exciting. I like, I've never experienced something that doesn't have music, that doesn't have all that stuff and felt like a rock concert. I was like, whoa, the energy was so incredible with all of us. And it was, it was just palpable, the waves of this, like the fun we were all having and all stuff. It was just, it was so special. I don't think we could have ever anticipated that feeling. Yeah. That's, I saw it on night two with the fire alarm. Oh, nice. Yeah. So story. So I saw it on Saturday night and there's, there's haze in the beginning and all of a sudden the fire alarm just goes off and Tom is already on stage. Like it's about to start and we're just like, should we get up? No? Cool. All right. We're just, we're just going to hang here. And then Jay comes out and he's like, yeah, we're, we think it's fine. But we're just gonna check it out. So just, just hang out. It's fine. Live theater, it's great. How do you how do you deal with moments like that, or if something goes a little crazy, or Ryan, you guys have done a lot of theater in the past and, and had those different experiences. What do you do? Well, if it was a real fire, we would have told yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really special experience. We're all gonna burn. I, um, I, <laughs> that's not okay. Um, but we were all very aware that night that there was not a problem. There was just not a legitimate emergency, but that the fire alarm, which I have, we both done shows in that theater and occasionally that fire alarm is persnickety, but it is safe and there are just too many sensors. It's persnickety. Yeah, it's a persnickety, they are persnickety ones. <laughs> what they're like. Persnickety is like. Well, I'm with Brits. It's like the only. Are they always like, you know, 
like Harry Potter and the Persnickety Alarm. Or something. Um, but it, but like, um, I missed that. I was sticking to my other friend. <laughs> but I mean, you you were pretty genius in what happened. Or like, you just well, no, because a guy, a, a guy, a guy came on like a live, real person and said, "Do not be alarmed. We have an alarm." <laughs> and it's like, surely that is the fundamental point of an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> to feel some kind of terror. Um, it's like another drink of wine. I'm like, we're fine. Yeah. Everything's good. But it was it was fine. But but I mean, but I guess again, that's the, the there are people who often because they're pretending to be in love in a, with a horse in 1920s Russia get frustrated when they hear an alarm or a phone go off because that would never happen then. But the amazing thing about this is that we we're just in that room, and if the fire alarm goes off in the room, then we go. That's a fucking fire alarm. Like, don't worry, you're not going to die. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe you are, but I don't know. <laughs> no, just I mean, to, but, but it'll I mean, have been worth it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, we, I mean, we would have, if it were something real, we would have walked out all with everybody else. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We were like, we're just, whatever happens kind of happens. I mean, the fire alarm is a very particular situation, but there are other situations where, you know, I've been in situations where people uncontrollably coughing just without stopping. And so, like, I have, like, cough drops in my pocket and I have... I have uh, I have a lot of other things that I won't I'll leave as a surprise because I don't want to preempt anyone who comes to see the show. But there are things that happen, and we don't when a, when a phone goes off. We're not one of we're not a group of people. Tom and I don't kind of go like, you know, we're acting. We just we just say like I have a number of times I do want to pick it up um, in the middle of the show, and I'd be so interested to see what happens if they did. Um, I, I mean, at one point someone did, and I was like, that was sort of a joke, but okay, I guess we could all sit here. But that's what happens, and, and, um, and we're not judging anybody, just like we hope they don't judge us, because we're telling these stories that are extremely personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm happy the fire alarm. There wasn't a real fire, although I would have loved to see you guys do the show, like, on the sidewalk, though. That's what Nick Payne always said. He was like, you could do this show on the sidewalk. Yeah. And, and, we, and to be, we would have. Like, like if, if people actually had to leave the building, we would have done it on the sidewalk. I, yeah, totally. Yeah. But, <laughs> like if there were a blackout, like yeah. what everybody else did on Broadway the other night. Yeah, really? they, yeah they did their shows on the sidewalk. Yeah. Really? Uh huh. Oh, yeah, so we're not actually doing anything. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I want to take a moment to talk specifically about Seawall. And so, Tom, on paper, Alex is, is very frantic and disorganized, and he goes through a whole range of emotions, but he always kind of has this this like almost like an ADHD you you move around the stage a lot and he kind of jumps around and he just like that feels like his personality and you play it so well and like I said I've seen the show before and it was great then but this time you really really honed it and like I I just felt for this guy the whole time and how did you find the balance of of playing frantic in a way that the audience still connect versus actually being frantic where it gets lost and you're like there's a difference between someone actually panicking and they can't get through versus being able to portray it in a way that's understandable. How do you how do you get there? Um, <laughs> no, I mean honestly, I I I, I don't really know. I I I, I and I'm and I'm I, I I don't I try as hard as I I don't really intellectualize my in my process like that, I, I, whatever that word means. Um, but I, I, I honestly, I just hear when I read something, I hear a voice in my head. I, I, and I kind of, my getting there is just trying to figure out how to be the voice in my head. And that's what the voice sounded like. Um, and the, I mean, the, 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 the writing is very specific. What, I mean, it, what we, we talk about these plays as incredibly organic experiences, which they are, but the writing allows for that in the sense that it, it's 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 organic nature is incredibly precise like every piece of punctuation we respect entirely every word it, it, it may it may feel like we're kind of stuttering or doing weird repetitions or but that's all in the text mm -hmm. um and i think it's important to kind of acknowledge that like that, that in, it, for shows that seem so and are so open to the evening like it's the genius of Nick and Simon who created that environment. Yeah, it was, 
I love that character. He's just so, I just want to hug him. I just want to hug him. Um, and I mean, Jake, you, gotta, you can if you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Jake, about a life. Um, so I was reading Maggie gave you some advice and your mom was like really eager to see it. Um, and you, you yourself are not a father, but your whole family is going to see it. Um, I was wondering how much, how much of advice did you take from other people versus how much did you kind of just let Abe to come to you? Um, because Maggie did give you some good advice. Yeah, going yeah. Into labor. yeah, no, she did. She, did. <laughs> she, as an older sister, was unimpressed by my by my um, my reenactment of, of labor as a woman in labor, which I do in the show. I, <laughs> I play a woman in labor, my wife uh, in labor, and myself in the midst of that. So I go back and forth between the two people um, in that scene. And my sister, when she first saw it, was like, I think um, you could work on something some things in that part as the woman and i was like i was like okay cool and so we talked a little bit about that um but um yeah i mean the show is i mean i just love my family um for all of their complications and um all the spaces in which we deeply love each other and all the spaces in which we have a real difficulty in loving each other um i still realize when I look up out and I look at it from above that I deeply love them and who I am and I've been formed by them and so the piece is really about that and that's what it makes me feel every night and whether or not you're a father or whether or not you're a son or whether you're a daughter or you're a mother or you're an uncle or whatever you are whether you've seen anyone and you've had loving feelings complicated feelings, whatever they are that's what the show is and so to me, it's not necessarily the specific experience of being a father as much as being a part of a family and being a part. And that doesn't even necessarily have to be a biological one. The idea that you are included in something and in that space as we walk through our lives, they are the things that give us that support, whoever that might be. I think anyone could play this part, like really a man or woman uh, in that way. And it just needs a little bit of trans transposing, you know, um, and that I think is the beauty of this piece. Um, and the other beauty is that like my older sister will always be my older sister, no matter what. If she told she threw something on the ground and told me to pick it up, I'd pick it up. And if I did something wrong in the scene, it, it is the most lasting, most impressionable thing someone can say to me is the thing that she says. So every night I try and strive harder and harder towards being a woman in labor in the best way that I possibly can. <laughs> You're getting pretty close. I think you could do it. Well, what's amazing is like Carrie has really guided us as a director that too, but she is a, a mother of three. And so she's really been able to illuminate a lot of things for me and try as best as she can to, <laughs> to show that experience to me. Um, and it, that has been very, very, and to have parents around me, Tom too, you know, to really um, direct me. Um, has been very, very, very helpful. Yeah. I mean, you're doing pretty good here. Thanks. You pull it off well. Thanks. Um, so I want to talk a moment about the, the creative side and some of the more things that aren't necessarily you guys talking at us um, during the show. Um, it feels very minimalistic. Um, the set, um, you guys can see pictures online, but it's kind of just a brick wall and then a platform. It just looks, there's a piano, there's a couple lights, and that's it. Um, but if you actually think about it, it's very, very detailed. That set was built. That was not there before. It's the same set that was um, at the public. Um, there's actually, uh, there's there's lighting. There are very specific sound cues. There's two costume designers, which I was very <laughs> amused by. I'm like, two people, two designers, that makes sense. Um, but where did this, this concept come from? Did you know you wanted to just kind of have a very minimalistic show? So um, I worked with a brilliant set designer here in New York called Laura Jelinek and we had a kind of long process and, and every show you start not knowing really and that's one of the most gorgeous things about directing and so what we both did was we just kept reading the texts and trying to find the kind of common themes and we did a massive image bank so we would collect like thousands of pictures mm -hmm. and then we just it's so odd. It's a kind of mixture of thinking and instinct. And ultimately you both try and sit in your instincts and you kind of build things in a model and you test them as ideas. And sometimes they feel illuminating and sometimes they don't. And what became clear was that we had to find a space where both of these people could just come and arrive and bring themselves and their coats and their bags and whatever baggage they have from that day and walk into the room and connect with the audience. And so the more we did with the set, the more it got in the way. 
And um, ultimately, we were really inspired by the architecture of the original theatre that we were working in at the public. And so we had this idea to just extend the brick walls and to try and make something that felt atmospheric and beautiful and, and kind of decaying in its own way, but simple. And I think Laura's done a really beautiful job. And then we've kind of evolved the design for the transfer. And we were really inspired by some photographs that were um, taken in London of a, of a group of really expensive houses on a place called Billionaire's Row in London, which are all empty and disused. And there's kind of moss growing up and ferns and gold taps with kind of plants growing out of them and because the houses have been empty for so long and so this time we've really taken that idea on and there are kind of this plant life growing up the brick wall and this feeling really that the the kind of two people just walk in each night to this abandoned room and then they start talking and i love the specific parts of this that doesn't agree i wanted to push your sleeves up the whole time but you're a new dad and you're frantic and i'm like Jake, sleeps come on um, <laughs> And and same with you, uh, Tom. You you're wearing like your clothes feel again very disheveled as the character does because he's so all over the place. And I'm just like, this is brilliant design because it's making me feel a kind of way, and they're not even pointing it out right now. Um, but I also want to talk a bit about the blocking, which for anyone who doesn't know what blocking is, it's the actual motion that the the actors take during the stage. Um, Tom, yours is very, um, you move around the whole set, whereas Jake, you are almost always entirely in one specific spot. And did you, for all of you, did you find that this was kind of in the script? Did your characters inform that? Was that something that was developed along the way? How did that come about? Because it felt very specific to this is what these guys would actually be doing. I mean, the rehearsal process, there was a lot of experimentation and there were versions of Jake's piece that had an enormous amount of movement and whole sequences that all got cut at different points and I mean it's trial and error and instinct rehearsals always and you know you and as a director you come in with a plan and as actors you come in with a plan and then you tend to throw that all away and and kind of ultimately it felt most meaningful for Jake to be in stillness and um and Tom to be kind of exploring the space and in motion the fact that they counterpoint I think is really helpful but I mean Carrie would try a different thing I mean one point she said, I brought a microphone in, do the whole thing on on a mic stand and a microphone. And that was sort of the initial idea of staying in one place. And then that didn't really work. And then the first preview, when we first did it downtown, Tom just said, I want to try it with a microphone one night out of the middle of nowhere. His, his preview process is one of the most incredible ones ever. He just makes the craziest choices. And then when we finally lock the show, it is what it is. But over the week before we open the show or 10 days before we open the show and we're performing in front of an audience, he does like, I'm just going to do this like a monkey. And you're like, oh, OK. And then, you know, so he did it in front of a microphone. He used the microphone. And I remember him walking off stage and like hand, literally like handing the microphone off, being like, well, I'm never doing that again. You know, <laughs> but like that was the first the microphone was the first idea of me staying in one place. But it was like Carrie was chipping away at something, but it wasn't exactly right. And it felt odd to me, but it was like something about and then finally the light keeping me in that place mm -hmm. and the idea. But without it. Um, it evolved and it was like it slowly it took weeks but it came I remember we decided you were like you want to do the whole thing in a spotlight in one preview I was like sure we'll try and then I forgot the entire second half of the monologue because I usually was moving so much I remembered my lines based on blocking mm -hmm. yeah and I had none yeah. that was a great night yeah. <laughs> I walked Life off stage theater. and I just said what's my next line and then our stage manager told me and I came back out and I was like and I said <laughs> <laughs> that's the cool thing about this show you we won't know. You like, it's not like you're relying on anybody else. It's like, you can walk off for like five minutes and be like, yep, yes, this part of the show. Yeah. So we're going to start our audience Q&A in just a moment. There's uh, microphones in the aisles. If you guys have any questions, just please line up and we will take a couple. So you guys, I mentioned before, you transferred from off-Broadway to Broadway. So what has kind of been the biggest shift for you guys in that? I think the audience, just the kind of... Uh, the thousand people is a significantly different energy um, and and also because of the kind of it does become an organism the audience and a single consciousness in a certain way and it's just it's that kind of when a thousand people are forced into thinking about the same thing it's just it's inc it's incredibly powerful to stand in front of and and you do you do feel I don't know like, are, are, like w when you're a single person versus that level of it's sort of Afterwards, you just kind of feel like you've been through something like pretty extreme. Um, On the first night, they were in shock, really, when we came off stage. And in fact, Jake said, I've got sweaty knees, which is really 
<laughs> it was pretty wild. Yeah, the energy is just like makes you like, even when you're standing in one place, you like re- don't realize how much energy you're generating and what's coming at you. And so I, I was sweating so much. It was like dripping down my shirt and then down my knee. And if I bent my pants, all the sweat was just like right here. <laughs> Such a strange thing. But um, yeah, I, it's it's like, there is nothing like Broadway. Yeah. There is just, I, I mean, there's nothing like the experience as an audience and there's just nothing like the experience as a performer. It is true. It is just, it's it's inexplicable. And also the, 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 a lot of the reasons where we, we can tend to be relatively ambiguous when talking about these plays is because there's something really beautiful about coming to them not knowing what they are. And, and the the Broadway audience, unlike the pub, the, the public is a relatively theatrically literate audience. Mm-hmm. They subscribe, like they sort of know what they're coming to see. Whereas what's been, what, I, the feeling I get in the room it, when we do these things with, with this audience is that they don't know. And it's astonishing that that kind of the, the surprise and the excitement they get from the, 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 the intentions of the plays. Don't be alarmed. You're going to be alarmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Bang. laughs> yeah, it definitely feels it definitely feels like a lot of people when I saw it came to see you guys and walked away just blown away at this piece. Hmm. And I think that really shows the, the craftsmanship of you guys and also the writing of just how great this really this show is just really good. Uh, we're gonna take a question right over here. Hi, um, I saw the show last night. It was really great. Thank you. Um, so my question was, um, how did you decide which order you were going to do the plays in? Because like it kind of makes sense how you've done it now, but like, can you see a universe where you would have done it the opposite way around? Hmm. We, the first reading of the show, we did um, the opposite way around. Um, and just to, due to the nature of the subject matter of both of the shows, I think there's sort of an ascension that you feel like when Tom moves through it, I think Tom's piece does a sort of, I think does this beautiful opening of people's hearts and then uh, that's the hard work. And then I get to sort of like, pretend like I've done some work and then <laughs> bring them to a really beautiful ending, I think. And I mean, right? I mean, that... It just somehow felt instinctively the right way around. And um, again, you just trust your gut. Yeah. Thanks. And over here. Um, I also saw the show last night and loved it, so bravo. And I went with my grandmother, who's a bit hard of hearing, but she enjoyed it regardless <laughs> because of just your body language and the way that you were able to emote. And so my question kind of stems from that. Um, you said the audience is different every night and you and you really sense a different emotion every night. So do you take any of your cues from the audience based on your body language? Or I know the blocking is probably pretty set, but... Um, the way that your tone or the volume, is there anything different night to night? I mean, entirely. I remember like, I was talking about um, my, uh, in the play, my father-in-law, like two nights ago, uh, having served in Northern Ireland and, and saying that it wasn't like, comparing that to it not being like, I can't remember what I said, like a, Oh my god! I can't really like the play. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> no, um, saying, saying, but it's saying, saying that it was, it, you know, he wasn't just playing pool with some kids. Anyway, it's like a line which no one normally reacts to, but this guy in the audience went, (laughs) there's this single person. And then for the next five minutes, I was like, this play is for you. (laughs) And I did, I just walked over for him and gave him the next five minutes. And and, and the the, the rest of the audience who were like, that wasn't that funny. Like, we're we're like, fuck, what does he know that we don't? (laughs) And it it, it really, it drove, like I could feel all of them being jealous of him. (laughs) And and kind of, and sort of, and then suddenly started randomly laughing at different moments to see if I would put it, put it, but yeah, they, they, they lead you through the, through, through the piece into entirely. Um, and when someone's, you know, moved by something, you know, sometimes like it, it is about parenthood and, you know, sometimes you can feel the majority of the audience actually aren't parents. They're kind of young, younger. And, and sometimes you can feel a kind of big section when I talk about the birth of my daughter, you can just feel a group of fathers and mothers just kind of remember that profound moment in their lives. And there's like a swelling in that space in the theater. And like, you just, yeah, you move to it and kind of share, share it with them. Yeah, you do feel the sort of generational differences. There are references you make to different generations and they, they respond and you can feel them in different parts of the audience. Sometimes there's like one generation spread out. And diff- I can, this is how it can feel. It's like they're over here and they're there. 
And then there's like a whole other generation that's there. And so when I know there's references generationally, you kind of like focus, like Tom yeah. said, that thing to those people. You know, there's a there's a line I talk about, like Austin Powers, and there's like, you know, probably your grandmother might love Austin Powers. <laughs> it's not the same, you know, so they're for another group. So it, it is like you we do tailor it and then things that they do then tailor uh, tailor our, our show from there. There are shows that there are just people who are so much laughing so much more. And then there are ones where they're just listening deeply and you just roll, you roll with them. Like you roll with where they are and how they feel. Thank and you, you. sorry, and, and you really can see them as well. I, 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 he, he can't as much, but I, I can, you know, I can look in some, someone's eyes and do, you know, do a whole section for them. And, and there, there's, it's just really beautiful when someone goes like, fuck, you're talking to me. Like, this is just for me. And it's like, it's really special. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> you, know, you, feel, you feel like we feel in the spotlight. That's how I feel. Right over here. Right over here. Hey, thanks for coming out again. Um, Jake, on the film side of things, you have some characters that have had like pretty intricate, romantic, and parental roles and elements to them. Uh, it comes to mind like Southpaw, Demolition, even um, Wildlife. Did you pull on any of those characters for this role too? I mean, you know, I I actually make no reference to anything in this. Some people have asked me questions about different things and behaviors that I do. It changes every night, so I'm not always clear about it. But I do believe that I, just like everything, every experience we have in our lives, we kind of carry them with us. You know, we're like kind of dragging them around. And when you're an actor, you carry around the weird fictional experiences and characters you've created too, um, as well as the experience you've had in your life then influence those characters. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just sort of dragging all those weird characters I've played around <laughs> um, in, like, some strange bag. Uh, and so, yeah, they're all there. And 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 truthfully, um, Nick's writing just speaks to something very personal in me. I don't, I've just fallen in love with his writing from the minute I read it. So um, I really carry his story and his, his dad, his daughter, his wife. Um, I never met his dad but I know his wife and I've never actually met his daughter, which is so odd to me. Um, but I love them so much and they're with me every night too, as well as my parents and all the weird characters I played and <laughs> all of it. So kind of, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> right over here. Um, so how'd you choose who would do which play? And if you thought about switching at all? I, I mean, the, the, our connection to the plays came from our relationship with the writers. And so th in a way they sort of chose us. Um, and we did, we, there, there was a moment where, where we talked about doing it. I, I think that, a, a, I mean, firstly, like Nick's piece is an, is an incredibly personal piece and like, there's a reason why he's got like his friend and ally to do it. Like it's a great responsibility. Um, and you know, there was a reason why he wasn't going to do it because of it's being so personal and so kind of turning it into an actor's game, like uh, switching it around, I think kind of di didn't feel necessarily appropriate. Um, and then on the other side, you try learning two monologues. <laughs> I think the thing about the two of us is we're all like so down for a challenge. Like that's what we want to do. I mean, I, and I, I, at first when we were going to move it to Broadway, we had that discussion because we thought, you know, that'd be kind of interesting. You know, you come back and you see the other actor do it. The strength it takes to do Tom's piece, this, the craft that it takes to do his piece, um, I don't know if I have that in me. Um, I think it would be really sort of schizophrenic, particularly given the, the, the really personal nature of both of the pieces, to be switching back and forth between those two worlds. They are so clearly not the same person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because of the nature of how we do this, it would just feel like to me, in my mind, like a little bit perverse, like Tom's saying, and, um, and there'd be a level of artificiality. Obviously, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. this is not real, and these are. But but we're trying as hard as possible to create an environment in which it feels like you know a, a honest shared experience. And I think if you, if you could come back the next night and see one of us playing the other character, you'd be a bit like, oh, that's kind of impressive. But I think it would it would take away from the kind of the intention of the evenings. Thank you. Yeah. Love you involved, boy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right great taste. Um, <laughs> I saw the play at the public um, a couple months ago, and oh my god, it was like 
you guys captured lightning in a bottle. I think that's the cliche. Um, and in fact, the night I was there, it was there was like an ASL interpreter, and in the middle of this of seawall. No, sorry, a light. Um, all of a sudden, someone's phone goes off, and it was the entertainer. Scott Joplin, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> like so loud that the usher lunges at this guy. Jake, you said, you know, you're like, it's okay, you can pick it. And I couldn't believe that you could get back into the monologue after breaking it in the middle. Um, so I guess I wanted to know sort of how you were able to get back in, but also you had said that Nick wouldn't let you do this for years. Mm -hmm. What do you think it would have been like had he said yes back then? Mm -hmm. so, those were so that I well thank you for thank you for coming. Um, but uh, yeah, I think to answer your last question first, um, that I don't I think I, there was nowhere there I was nowhere near ready to be able to do this show, um, and somewhere in his bones because he's such an extraordinary writer and artist he knew that his instinct was telling him that, um, and no and he wasn't ready. Um, and truthfully, I think the courage that it's taken from him to allow me to do it is probably some of the most, the deepest stuff that I've shared with someone um, in my artistic career. Um, and it has taken us a number of years to get to that point. Like any friendship, any love, it takes a long time to develop something true and deep. And that has allowed us to get to this place. In, in terms of the, the, the movement of the piece and what happens in it, uh, both Tom and I knew that we, and this is not like either of us, I don't think, but we knew we had to be off book before we started rehearsals because a monologue itself is just, you are you are fighting with all of those amazing things that you feel inside yourself, but also all those demons. And they're coming at you right and left, not only from your own projections, or the experiences you've had during the day and all those things, but also, you know, just what the text brings up. So you have to be agile enough when you are in a strangest state to be able to deliver this thing. And so we were just ready, like ready to go from the second uh, we were out there just with the words. Um, and, and that allows you when things happen to really fit, then forget the words and it connect with the, peop with the people in the audience. And so when things happen, I know exactly where I am. And if I don't know where I am in my brain, I know it in my bones. And anyone who does whatever work you do knows that feeling when you're just vibing it in like a just the right way and you know how to do it and it's unconscious. That's where we want to get to. So, and I just happen to love the entertainer as a song and I didn't really want to. <laughs> um, I actually, on repeat, that's my pre-show. It's just entertainment on the phone. <laughs> Um, I found it serendipitous and I just wanted to share that moment. And by the way, I'm just, you do this a lot of times. You just want to have something else different happen. So I'm interested in what conversation that person would have, what they were going through. So, yeah. I would love to ask a Spider-Man question, but um, my question was... <laughs> and then you can ask a Spider-Man question. That's okay. <laughs> so loud. I'll answer. Just <laughs> <one> question. <laughs> so, uh, my first question is about the process of your both of you as an actor when you're preparing and researching for a, a theatrical production as compared to maybe a film on a bigger stage what are the nuances in preparing for them and how do you try to bring those characters to life on both these places i mean i th think by n necessity the main difference is that your preparation process on a film is normally pretty private I, short. It, it, it's oh, short. Well, it's short. It's short. I mean, whatever. It is, it's, you, you kind of do it on your own, and then you bring your work like to the day, or, and and you kind of, you know, you s suddenly a group of people who prepared totally separately come together, and you know, magic or not happens. Um, <laughs> whereas you know, th th this this is very much a communal uh, experience, preparation wise. You know. The rehearsal process is a group of us all together in a room, slowly trying to attritionally uh, attack this text. Um, and I think, you know, for me personally, the first idea that comes into my head is almost always moronic. Um, and therefore, to be in a room in which someone can kind of challenge you on that is incredibly exciting. Mm. Um, yeah. What he said. 
<laughs> What's your Spider-Man question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> Man, Spider-Man. Oh, there's, there's a Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Serial Spider-Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is Mysterio going to be back in the Sinister Six? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we twice the yes, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh wow i mean like i think that i you know i mean i, I mean you know i just said i feel like a dart is just gonna suddenly shoot i know into the back of his head. I'm, go, what? I'm like that's really interesting to me. <laughs> 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 Oh, I lost my mic. Sorry. Uh, oh, whoops! I lost my mic. I can't answer. Um, no, I, I mean, I think that I think uh, I, I'm I, just sad. Yeah. I? He, he's dead, man. <laughs> right? Uh, right? Uh, right? That's what's coming. All right, we can do one more quick question. Um, so I actually initially had a really similar question about how the medium informs your relationship with the character. Um, so instead, I'll ask about the other English Tom in your life. <laughs> oh my God, I've been really trying to keep that secret. <laughs> um, well, we have a, we've all had a very uh, complex relationship. Uh, it has been a quick transition from Spider-Man <laughs> Press Tour to this show, and they are both named Tom, um, which, uh, is complicated, but I think they're willing to share. Uh, no, I, um, yeah, uh, British Toms are just great. I don't, I don't really know how to put it any other way. I mean, like, I, I just, I have, in real, in, in all honesty, I have really never, I feel so lucky to be, to have worked with two people who I genuinely adore and who are, uh, loving and encouraging, and then also just so damn good at what they do. And um, I think that does say something about British culture. Um, and and yet, and yet somehow we're still better. Um, <laughs> sorry, I gotta go. <laughs> no, but no, but it, they are just such incredible artists and people. And he and 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 Mr. Holland, which is Opus, um, is uh, <laughs> I don't know why. My favorite. Film. A generational. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's just great. He's just great, man. He's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one last question for me, for all three of you. What do you hope audience take away from the show? What is the one thing that when they leave, you really want them to remember? The thing I love is when you see people leave and ring their family. And that happens a lot. And I watch people come out because I'm obviously in the auditorium and in the bar. And I think every night some people go out and they ring their dad or they ring their mum or they ring someone they haven't spoken to for a while. And there's something about a kind of moment of communion to just think about the things that you value and the people that you connect with. And that's pretty rare, I think. So... That's really special when that happens. I mean, I think Gary's said it much more articulately and with a British accent, so it sounds better. Way cooler. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I hope that people walk away with like just a warm heart and walk out from this nice, cool theater into the warm summer air and just like are thinking about the people they love and have loved and that... Um, they 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 feel loved really i know that sounds pretty general but um that's how we feel when we walk off stage um and we hope that the audience walks away with that as well oh uh, yeah i mean I, I guess what 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 i love about it is is that we kind of don't need to be prescriptive about what we want people to feel it's it, it's um there's something about theater that i always kind of inherently mistrust sometimes which is this idea of consensus that like a large group of people are supposed to feel exactly the same thing at exactly the same time we're all supposed to all laugh at that joke and we're all supposed to clap at this moment which i think is wrong i think it's an inherently democratic experience and what i love is the fact that a thousand people are feeling totally different things mm -hmm. and leaving with totally um different experiences and I hope that we facilitate that ability to come as yourself and experience your version of the play. Mm -hmm. That 
That's a great way to end it. Um, see Wall of Life is playing a limited run on Broadway at the Hudson Theater. You can see it until September 29th. You can find more information at seewalllife.com. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, Carrie Pratt, Nell Dick, Holland Town Square.